What's up? What's up? Only these two people said what's up back to me. Sup? How's it going? It's good to see you guys. Oh, that's much better. I walked in and I was like, it's so dim in here. And I thought maybe it was just me. Um, that's right. That's right. You weren't here yet, Debbie. That's got to be it. That has to be it. You're right. Well, thank you guys for joining us. How many of you guys had a crazy week? Raise your hand if you had just a crazy, crazy week. I had an unbelievably crazy week this week. It was wild. Um, but, uh, but, I, but I made it. It's Sunday now, which for me, Sunday is kind of the end of the week, not really the beginning. You know, does anybody else feel that way? Is Sunday the end or the beginning? If you think it's the end, raise your hand. If you think it's the beginning, raise your hand. Yeah, it's supposed to be the beginning. You're right. But <laughs> in my schedule, it always seems like it's kind of like the last thing. On the, and then Monday is sort of a new week, um, which I think next week is going to be crazy, too. So very exciting. But uh, I'm glad you guys made it out to finish or start your week, depending upon what your perspective is, uh, with us here at church. Thank you guys online for joining us as well. If you're online, don't forget to like and share the feed. It's a great way to get your friends to see it. And then also don't forget to write your name in the comment section because we like to know who is watching. I want to invite all of you guys to uh, stand. We're going to sing some songs this morning. I'm really excited um, about some of the stuff that we're going to sing. We're going to start off by just saying that we are going to praise the Lord together. So I want to invite you guys to stand and sing this together.
when I was uh, when I was um, just starting to play music and stuff, uh, I used to say that I hate songs with a bunch of repeating in them. Like that was my thing. I don't like songs repeating, and I've sort of since like changed that view. I don't like songs that repeat for no reason. Okay, so that song, you know, you sing the same thing over and over again, but the whole point of that song is that your praise is always going to be on your lips at all times. And so I love how that song ends with a bunch of repeats because it's like, man, this is the point of the song that I'm going to be, you know, constantly praising the Lord. So uh, yeah, I love I love that song. Uh, such a such a poignant way to put that at the end. But uh, let's keep let's keep it going. Let's keep the praise on our lips this morning. you are so good, and that is what we want to ask of you this morning, that you would give us clean hands, that you would direct our attention towards you, that we would just uh, come to this service, come to this group of people with humility and say, God, we, we are not perfect, but we want to follow you, and so uh, show us how to do that more effectively uh, through what takes place today. Show us how to uh, love you and know you better through our service. Here you my pray. Amen.
come confess and know that you are holy and know that you are holy and all will sing out Go on and 
and tell it to the masses that he is God. Amen. Thank you guys for singing. You can have a seat. Before we uh, jump into James, I want to remind you guys to stay connected this week. Um, we've got some great opportunities to do that. Uh, some of them we'll talk about later, but one of the greatest ways that you can stay connected is by going online and filling out our connection card. Or if you're in person, there's connection cards on the back table that you can fill out as well. It's a great opportunity to let each other know how we can pray for one another. Um, so that's found at pondhill.net slash Sunday. If you're online, you can get it there. Or if you're in person, you can pull up your phone, fill that thing out. Um, and uh, that's going to be super helpful. If you are in need of anything this week, if you need anything from us, or if you have any prayer requests that you'd like the staff to pray for, go ahead and just write us a note in that as well and share your prayer requests. Um, there is uh, a prayer letter that goes out every week, and we include those prayer requests. So... Um, we would love to be praying for you this week, and I think everybody else here would. As we're thinking about our own prayer requests, we want to remember the prayer requests of our global partners as well. So this morning, we are focusing on the Lalans. There are missionaries to Quebec, Canada, so they're um, some of our closest missionaries, and um, they have a ministry up there where they're leading a church, and they're doing, doing uh, things in their community. So we want to be in prayer for them. Um, I know... I, in reading their letters that COVID has been a big deal uh, there, just like it has been everywhere else. And so they're sort of still recovering from that, just like everybody else is. And uh, so pray for them as they navigate those waters. They've got some family things going on as well. So pray for them um, as they deal with some of that. Uh, if you want to hear more about those missionaries or any missionaries, you can always let us know. We have their uh, prayer letters that we can send to you, and uh, you can read what they're doing and how they're ministering. And um, the cool things that God is doing and some of the things that they're asking God to do as well. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a moment to pray. I want you guys to pray for what's on your heart and then also pray for the Lalans. And then uh, I will pray uh, after a couple moments and, and we'll jump into our uh, teaching on James. God, you are such a good God, and we want to say thank you for uh, being here with us. We want to say thank you that you have brought us all through this week, that you have um, helped us along through some of the more difficult parts, that you've been with us to experience some of the, the better parts. And uh, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us in uh, your word and through what's said and through the conversations that take place here as a community and uh, through the words that we sung. I pray that we would just see you clearly. Uh, because we know that as we get to know you, we get to become more like you. And um, we want to be somebody that reflects your, your goodness and your beauty. So I pray that you would teach us how to do that better today. I want to pray for the uh, Lalonde family up in Quebec, that they would just be um, blessed today, that they would feel your presence in a special way and, and uh, be with their services as well. Uh, I think they're a bit... Uh, earlier than us, but there's a little time difference. So maybe they are about to go into their service or maybe they've already had it, but I pray that you would just be with them as they minister to their community there. And uh, I pray for their family. I know there's some things going on in their family. And so I pray that you would just bring wisdom to them and that you would bring comfort where comfort is needed and um, bring, uh, you know, any, any aid to that situation that you can um, and uh, help them to get through the tough times that they're going through right now. I thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be together, and I pray that you would just give us a great Sunday. In your name I pray. Amen. I hope that you guys have been uh, following with us in James. We have been studying through James, and it has been such a cool study. It's been a difficult study because James is a little uh, pointed in some of his language, and also there's just so, so much content in this in this book, uh, even with the time that we've allotted for it, which is big. This is one of our biggest sermon series this year. It's just not enough to get through everything. So um, 
So yeah, it's been a little challenging for us on the uh, pastoral side, trying to pick out what to and not to talk about and um, how deeply to get into it. So, so when, uh, when me and dad sit down to do the preaching schedule, we do it a whole year in advance, um, and I don't necessarily keep track of what, what week we're talking about what. Like, I don't really know that until the week of, because it's just a lot of information to go through. So I just, we do it in one sitting or two sittings, and then I kind of let it there. But so I, so when uh, my father decided to go away this week, this was sort of, sort of a last minute decision. He decided to go down and uh, enjoy a wedding reception with my cousin. Um, and so he's down in Texas right now. So pray for him as he'll be traveling back up here this week. But um, when he said he was going to be away, uh, I thought, oh, I wonder what we're teaching about on Sunday. And then I said, I got 20 bucks. This is the sermon on generosity. Like, I just knew it had to be because we, I knew there was a, somewhere going to be a sermon on generosity. I did not know it was going to be this week, but I said, once dad said he wasn't going to be here, I said, guess what we're going to talk about? It's going to be generous. And I was, and I was right. It was generosity. We have kind of a running joke that since I've been hired full-time at the church, dad has never spoken on money or generosity because I always end up having to preach those sermons. It's not even intentional. It just happens to be that, or maybe it is intentional on his part. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. All kidding aside, though, I actually don't really mind about talking about giving and generosity because, um, you know, it's a lot of thing that, it's, it's one of those things that a lot of preachers dread talking about because they feel like they're asking for people's money or, or maybe they're just uncomfortable talking about that kind of thing. But it, it seems like a lot of us have been raised with maybe that experience where we've had that experience where there's been a pastor asking for money a lot or maybe every Sunday there's like this big ask for money or something like that. That's an experience that a lot of Christians have had over the years. But I really don't mind talking about it because I think we have a really generous church, first of all. Um, and we're going to talk about that actually later in our, our business meeting. Um, but, but as also, as Gordy likes to say, I don't think that we can outgive God. Right. So, so ultimately, I think that generosity is really important. And here's like the big idea for this morning, okay? Yahweh is a generous God, so we too should be generous. That's like the big idea. That's it. We can all go home. It's all done now. No, not really. So here's the thing. James actually talks about this a ton. So I want to walk through the book. We're going to start in chapter 1, end in chapter 5. We're not going to read all of the book, but we're going to look at the times where he talks about uh, generosity. So stick with me. Grab your Bibles. If you, if, you, if you haven't already, we're going to be flipping through those pages. Now, there's a running contrast in James about the rich and the poor. So I think we need to start there because James talks about these two groups individually sometimes. Sometimes he gives specific instructions to one or the other, um, or sometimes he condemns one and praises the other or vice versa. Um, and so we got to talk about what the rich and the poor are. So um, we have to remember, here's where we're going to start. We have to remember that when James references the rich and the poor, we as 21st century Americans are classified in the rich category, not the poor category, Okay. We, we have to remember that when James references the rich and the poor, we as 21st century Americans are the rich. Now, I know some of you may not feel very rich, and trust me, I'm right there with you. Um, and uh, However, in context, we as Americans are super, super rich. So compared to the rest of the world, the average American is considerably better off. And I, I looked this up uh, on Pew Research, which is a, which is a, a statistic... Um, organization that puts together a lot of statistics. This is what they said in this article. The U.S. stands head and shoulders above the rest of the world. More than half, 56% of Americans were high income by the global standard, living on more than $50 per day in 2011, the latest year that could be analyzed with the available data. So it was a little while ago, but I think it probably stands even more true. Another 32% were upper middle income. In other words, almost nine in 10 Americans have a standard of living that was above the global middle income standard. Only 7% of the people in the U.S. were middle income, 3% were low, and 2% were poor. So that's not to say that U.S., along with other advanced economies, does not struggle with issues of income inequality and poverty. But given the much higher standard of living in the U.S., what is considered poor here is a level of income still not available to most people globally. Now, I read that long quote just because I thought it was really, really powerful. Essentially, what it says is that 
98% of us at least would not be classified in what is globally considered poor. So when James says in his first chapter, James 1, 9 through 10, he says this, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. So when James makes statements like that, we should identify with the rich. At least 98% of us should. Not only should we identify with the rich in James, but we should also identify with uh, we should also not identify with the poor. Here's what I mean by that, and th this is why I make the distinction. So not only should we also identify with the rich, but we should not identify with the poor. James 1.1 1, 1 kind of gives us a clue as to who James is writing to in this book. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. I think we might have talked about this before, but that, that phrase, the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, refers to Jews who had at one point lived in Jerusalem, but had left Jerusalem because of intense persecution following Jesus' crucifixion. Remember in Acts the story of the stoning of Stephen, or this guy Saul that was going around imprisoning Christians and possibly killing them as well, or even after Saul's conversion to Paul, the many times where he was beaten for proclaiming the name of Jesus. Um, so this is just a couple examples of the persecution that was going on here. Now, when that persecution came, one of the things that happened was a lot of Jewish Christians from Jerusalem left Jerusalem and went somewhere else, leaving their home, their families, and their wealth behind. So a lot of these people had essentially become homeless nomads and gone other places in the world. And James actually even gives uh, some hints that there was probably some rich people that had essentially allowed these fleeing refugee Jewish Christians to become indentured servants. And on top of having to become an indentured servant, the rich people were oppressing them. There's some evidence in James that that was going on uh, in the historical narrative as well. So what's interesting here is when, when, J when James references the poor, the, po the people that he's talking to probably have experienced poverty significantly more than many of us have experienced poverty as well. So not only do we identify with the rich, but we also definitely don't, at least most of us don't identify with the poor as well. So I only say this to say, when James encourages generosity towards the poor, the vast majority of us as Americans are the ones who are called to be generous. And that's what I want to uh, kind of clear up before we even get into these scriptures. In contrast, we are the rich who are called to be generous towards the poor. That said, why does James have us be generous? And he actually answers that question a lot. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through five reasons to be generous some of you may be like, why are we even talking about that? Because I already know I should be generous. But we're going to talk about James' five reasons. In doing that, we're also going to bring up some really uh, practical ways that we can be generous. And we're also going to be looking at what Christian generosity in particular looks like. All right? So here we go. We're going to jump in. Number one, here we go. God is a generous God. We already talked about that. Why should we be generous? Because Yahweh is a generous God. He, uh, whenever we talk about uh, virtue meaning something that is good, that we are called to be, whenever we talk about a virtue, it's got to start with God. It has to be rooted in the character of God. When we talk about our Christian character, we're, we're in being a Christian and having that character, we're trying to be like God's character. So we got to talk about God's character. James actually starts the conversation with this as well. In James 1, 16 through 18, he says this, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That last verse is really important. He uses this term, of his own will begat us. That word begat, you may have heard that in some other places in the scripture. What that refers to is a new birth. So we have new life. He's borrowing from uh, Jesus talking in uh, John 3. When Jesus explains to Nicodemus that the way to get into heaven is to be born again. So there's this idea that we have a new birth, we become a new creature, we are a new person. And as that new person, one of our jobs is to reflect the character of God. So if God is the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness or shadow of turning, who constantly gives good gifts at all times, then we as people that are born in his image as Christians should be 
very generous, giving gifts at all times. Um, so that's kind of the idea. So before we move on, I got to say, the reason why this new birth is possible is because God himself gave us a really, really good gift in the form of Jesus Christ, right? Perhaps the best gift that God gave us was his own son being given, coming to earth, only to die on a cross with full knowledge that he would go to the cross eventually. He bore that suffering for our, on our behalf so that in believing in him, confessing in him, and committing to live a life in following him, we can be born again, as Jesus said in John chapter 3. That's, that's kind of the reference point for our generosity, is that God gave us a really, really good gift that allowed us to be born again into a, a new creature, that reflects God's character, and God is generous, so we too should be generous. Pretty simple, right? Pretty simple logic there. But that's where we got to start, because we can't talk about who we are without talking about who God is. And because he's generous, we too should be generous. Boom, that one's easy. Nice and quick, short, right? Let's go to number two, um, which may, may or may not be longer. It's a little longer, sorry. Here we go. Generosity reflects God, we already kind of talked about that. So one of our primary messages in James is to not only be a hearer of the word, but also somebody that does the word, a doer of the word. Many of you guys have brought that up in my life group as the most, most uh, important part of James, the biggest takeaway of James, that we're not just to be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. In fact, our, our series, Real Faith, is named after that concept. We don't want to have fake faith that doesn't act what it hears. We want to have real faith that acts like what it speaks like. James talks about this specifically on two different occasions, and both times he references generosity. First James 1, 25 through 27 says this, But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Now, we talked about taming the tongue a couple weeks ago. If you missed that, you should go on YouTube and listen to it. It was really, really good. It was a, a powerful sermon. It was a little bit of a kick in the pants, but it was a really, really good sermon. It's an important part of James. He mentions it many, many times. I would definitely encourage you guys to go to YouTube and check that out. If you missed it, I think it was two weeks ago. Uh, but here's what he says right after that in verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fathers and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So let me summarize here. Pure religion is generosity. Pure religion is generosity. James mentions two things that identify you as a doer of the word. Number one, hold your tongue, right? Number two, be generous, it's interesting that those two things in particular, James would mention. What makes it even more interesting is that he does the exact same thing when he talks about it later in chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. He says, What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he has faith and not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them those things, which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead being alone. So once again, he's trying to illustrate real faith. If you are a doer of the word, somebody that lives and has a live faith, real faith, then when somebody comes to you needing help, needing clothing or food, you're not just going to say, I'll pray for you. You are going to give them clothing and food. That's generosity, right? So James says, if you want to have real faith, you've got to be generous. He actually doesn't even mention the tongue in this particular passage. He does later on in the book again, but it seems to James that one of his primary concerns with being a Christian is that generosity. I would even say, because he uses it twice when he's talking about this, that generosity is the easiest example of faith. Generosity is the easiest example of faith, especially faith that works, that is real faith, Faith that is a doer of the word, not just a hearer. We're actually going to talk about that more, I believe, next week. So come back and talk about being a doer rather than a hearer. But I think it's so, so interesting. You know, you would think that the biggest example of being a Christian would be like not sinning, right? Or like taking place in the church service or like serving other people or something like that, right? 
But no, actually what James says, the, most, the, most, uh, the easiest example of faith is, is generosity, not something else. And in particular, serving the, the poor, being generous to the poor. So in James' words, it's one of, if not the best way to be a doer of the word, not a uh, hearer only. Now, I think it's really important, because, because he puts so much emphasis on this, it's really important that we take his words really, really seriously, okay? So I want to talk to you about a question that I've heard a couple times now, a question that I had as well. In James 1.27, which we already read, there's a particular recipient of generosity mentioned. So James says that pure religion is to visit the fatherless and the widows. The fatherless and the widows. Now, who is that today? And why are those particular people uh, singled out in James' uh, really powerful statement that pure religion, real faith, is ministering to these people? So what's so special about the fatherless and the widows? Let me give you just a little bit of history as to why this is. Now, in the ancient Near East, as you may already know, they had a really, really patriarchal society. So you may say, well, today is patriarchal too, but that's, it's different back then, okay? So what happened was um, everything was built on the family. So all of your wealth was transferred from the patriarch, the father figure of the family, down to the next patriarch, which would be the firstborn son. And then as that guy got older, he would transfer his wealth to the firstborn son, his firstborn son, and it kind of continued and continued and continued that way. It was all through the fathers. Now, it wasn't just about your estate, though. It was also about your social status. So everything about you socially was based on the fact that you were, your name, son of someone else. That's why when you look into biblical genealogies, they all have that language. They say, so-and-so, son of so-and-so's dad, right? And so forth and so forth. So that's kind of the idea. Now, why then, or maybe that makes it more clear why James uses the fatherless and the widow as his examples of recipients of generosity, because those two people had been separated from their patriarchal figure, right? If you were an orphan, you had no patriarchal figure because you had no father, and you were therefore extremely poor. If you were a widow and your husband had died, you have no patriarchal figure, and so therefore you are generally extremely poor in these uh, in this culture. Now our culture has since changed a little bit, but I think even that could probably be, I mean, we could take it pretty literally as well still that we should love orphans and widows. I think that's absolutely still important, um, but I think it was extremely, extremely poignant for people living in that day. So what does that look like here in America? How can we kind of like see what James is getting at here? Well, I think what it is, is James is asking us to love the people with the least amount of what we call social equity, the least amount of social equity. These are the people that for whatever reason are devalued by society for whatever reason, and they have less social equity. They overall make less money and they have less capital and they have less estate and it's harder for them to get going. That, that, those types of people. Now, we could debate back and forth on who those people are, right? We could say it's this group of people or this group of people or this group of people. Here's what's not up for debate, okay? It's not me. That's what's not up for debate. The people that are the least equitable, I would not fall into their category. That's what I know. So, so me, as somebody who is white, male, straight, etc., do not fall into the category of the least social equitable. And the reality is we could label, we could absolutely label this, and I know this word gets thrown a lot of, around a little bit flippantly, but the reality is, is that I was raised with quite a bit of privilege, a lot of privilege. And so I, as somebody who is rich in privilege, need to be equitable to people of lesser social equity here. Now, I, like I said, I don't want to get into like super details and debates and things like that, but the reality here is, is that there's a lot of statistical proof that in general, me as a white male uh, cisgender person that grew up here is just, we, I have more privilege than other people. And the reality is, is that many of us still have more privilege than other people. I'm not really alone up here either. And those are just kind of like the buzzwords. I also grew up in like a very nice town. My parents owned the home in which I grew up. 
I have a college education. There's many other ways that I didn't even mention that I, I have so much privilege. The reality is that my background, my skin color, my gender, um, my sexual identity, all of these things have essentially given me opportunities to be the rich that James talks about. And if we go back to our conversation that we had, in reality, even if you're, you don't share all the privileges that I share, you still are in America, and so 98% of you still have a lot more privilege than the rest of the world. Okay, so you don't leave me up here stranded, right? <laughs> all, everybody else in this room probably has more privilege than most other people in America because it's likely that you drove a car which you own to come to service today, right? It's likely that you are living in a place that you can afford. I know that that's less likely than the former thing, but it's, it's likely that you're not worried about where your lunch is going to come from after service. Uh, all these things are are privileges that we need to uh, identify about ourselves. And I personally have felt convicted by the Spirit over the past couple years as things have uncovered in our race conversation, in our LGBTQ plus conversation, in our um, just in general social equity conversation. I have felt convicted that, man, I have never really come to grips with the fact that I was raised in a very privileged environment. And so I need to identify with the rich and learn how to be generous like God is generous. Okay, I'm going to stop talking about that so that I don't get myself into too much trouble. <laughs> so when I hear James reference the fatherless and the widow, I think of people that are underprivileged, that have less social equity than me. And so therefore, I am concerned with how to be generous. Now this I think our, the author of our book, Greg Gilbert, that we're going through in Life Group, he puts this in a really, really practical way. So listen to this quote. In what areas of your life do you have a certain degree of power? How do you use it? For example, how do you treat your employees, the family that rents your property, the person who cleans your office building or school, the person who makes your food at a restaurant? Do you treat them as a means to the end of your own self-indulgence, or do you treat them as people whom God has put in your life for you to love and care for? When you find yourself in a position of privilege in any way, even simple, as simple as being the one that's sitting down at a restaurant, not the one that's serving you your food or the one that's cooking your food, even as simple as that, when you find yourself in privilege, how are you looking for opportunities to be generous? That is Greg Gilbert's idea with this quote. How are you looking for ways to be generous? And maybe it starts with tolerance, but then it continues from there. It leads to give blessings and good gifts, just like Yahweh, the Father of lights, has given to you. So let's see like a specific way that James mentions is that this happens. So number three here is God pays special attention to the poor, so we should too. God pays special attention to the poor, so we should too. James 2, 5 through 7 says this, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him? But you have despised the poor. Don't rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Don't they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? Something about God's character leads him towards the poor. Something about God says that he wants to take the poor and make them the ones that come out on top. Something about God loves the underdog story. And maybe that's why we as humans love it too, is that maybe that's an image of God thing, that we just love underdog stories. But something about Yahweh compels him to um, love the poor in a special way. And it's interesting here because uh, we are often opposed to those principles. Last week, we talked about partiality, right? What was the biggest problem that James, uh, recipients of James' letter were having problems with? Well, it was that they were partial towards the rich. They gave special treatment to the rich while they gave not, the op I guess, special treatment, but negative special treatment to the poor. And so James says, man, you cannot be a respecter of persons because God loves everybody equally. But in loving everybody equally, God also enjoys to use the poor in an unexpected way. And so when God says that he pays special attention to the poor, I'm going to take that super seriously. And I'm going to say, I also need to pay special attention to the poor. One of the things very recently, probably this year, that God has been bringing to my attention is the amount of homeless people that I drive past to get to work. 
Um, and there's quite a bit of homeless people that I see, and I see the same people um, pretty, pretty often. And so one of the things that I felt God saying to me was that I needed to do something about that. So, it, you know, it's not anything crazy, but it's simple. When I do my shopping at BJ's, so when I go to BJ's, I buy one of those giant boxes of granola bars or something, and that stays in my car at all times. So at any time I'm at a red light and there's somebody looking for food, it's easy to just reach in and, and give it to them. And it's really like simple, and I'm not trying to say that I, you know, I got the answer and I'm doing a great job. That's not what I mean to say. What I mean to say is that sometimes it's as simple as that, just saying, man, homeless people are less equitable than me. I live in a home. Well, I live in an apartment, but you know, you, I live in an apartment or a home or whatever. You know, They have less equity than me, so as an image of God bearer, I need to be generous to them. And it could be as simple as that. You know what I mean? But it also could go further than that. You can figure out what it looks like for you in, in your own life. Um, but I think that we need to have our eyes open for people that are less socially equitable than we are and look for ways to be generous to them at all times because God has a special attention for those people. So I think we should as well. Ultimately, Yahweh is a generous God, and so we too should be generous Here's number four. Generosity is a part of choosing God instead of choosing the world. James puts it this way in chapter four, verses two through four. He says, you lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God, Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Here, James is addressing a specific problem that is the opposite of generosity in his uh, readers. He says that you guys want things for yourself so much that you're stepping on each other, you're hurting each other to get those things. And the reason why you don't have those things is because you don't ask for them or you ask for the wrong things because you just want those things and you're going to spend it on your own desires right? And so that is the idea here. That's the thing. The world's way is self-indulgence. Self-indulgence. The world's way is to say, if you want something, you go after it, right? The world's way is to say, if you have to get around other people or step on other people to get there, go for it, because it's all about self-indulgence. But what James says is we should not be that way. In fact, what that is, is what he calls friendship with the world. He says every Christian has the opportunity to make the choice. Am I going to be a friend of the world and an enemy of God, or am I going to be a friend of God and an enemy of the world? He puts a really clear choice. You can't do one or the other. You can only do one because friendship with God is enmity with the world, and, and friendship with the world is enmity with God. So there's, there's one way that I think is really, really important to identify with God. So w w I've heard it said that if you want to know what somebody cares about, all you have to do is look at their checkbook, or now that we're in the 21st century, look at their bank statement or their mobile app or something, right? So, and I think that that is like a really, really uh, powerful point because it's absolutely true. If you were to look at my a uh, bank account, you would see that I am like a hyper nerd that spends a lot of, way too much money on cardboard and games and things. Um, and you would see, you know, some other things that I care about having a place to live and um, that that's food. Yes, at least a small amount of food and, uh, and, and the church. And that's like pretty much it. If you, I'm, I'm kind of an open book on if you were to look at my finances, I don't spend money on a lot of different things. I just spend too much money on a few things. Yeah, some of you guys might be with me on that too. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying necessarily that I'm not going to tell you how to spend your money specifically, but what I am going to say is that if somebody was to look at your bank account statement, would they be able to tell that you are a friend of God more so than you're a friend of the world? Is there a line item in your bank account or on your bank statement that says this person cares about the things of God? I don't want to tell you exactly how to spend your money. That's not my goal today. What I am saying is that there's a really strong scriptural precedent for giving to the things of God, which often take place through the church. So I think there's a really... Now, I've got an 11-page manuscript in front of me right now. 
two paragraphs around giving to the church out of the 11-page manuscript. So I don't want this to be taken out of context. This is a very small part of what generosity is all about. But I do think that there is a lot of precedent to giving to the church. Now, a lot of people talk about tithing, okay? And you might say, well, tithing isn't even mentioned in the New Testament, so why are we even talking about it here in a Christian church? Well, I believe in, I believe in the tithe. In fact, I believe in the tithe enough that I pay the tithe as somebody that's paid by the church and that works for the church. Here's why I think that the tithe is important, because the tithe is less so about a percentage than it is about giving the first fruits. In the Old Testament, God set up that the Israelites would bring the first 10% of their crops to the temple and donate it to the temple, and that was used for ministry, and it was also used to, to uh, sustain the people that didn't farm that worked the temple instead. That was kind of the idea of the tithe. We don't live in that society, so we don't have to tithe. Okay, that's fine logic. However, the idea of bringing the first portion of your income to the Lord I think is bigger than just an Old Testament practice of tithing. I think it's really important that when we sit down, so if you were to sit down and look at my checkbook, you can see that sometimes I'm late on stuff, right? Occasionally, usually within the grace periods, I'm late on things. One thing that I try very, difficult, very hard to not be late on is my giving to the church because I want my giving to the church to be a first fruit gift. And I think that the idea of making a percentage is a really great idea. I'm not going to tell you what number. The tithe means 10%, but it doesn't have to be 10%. It could be less. It could be more. Whatever it is that you are, I would suggest 10% because I think that's a good, I think there's, like I said, scriptural pref precedence for it. But that's between you and the Lord, not between you and I. Um, however, what's important is that we give, I think, in proportion to what we've received. So as God blesses us more, we end up giving more. When we go through a hard time, it gives us an attainable goal to reach, not an overstretch. You know what I mean? Um, so I think, that it's, I think that it's really important to do a proportional gift that is your first fruits. It's the first priority of your finances to do that, such that you would be willing to be late on something else so that you could pay it. That's just my, that's an example for me. Maybe some of you guys are in the same place. Maybe you guys are better established and more responsible than me, and you don't have that problem, but I sometimes do. So... Now, here's the most important thing about this idea. Giving to the Lord does not stop with your giving to the church. Generosity does not stop with your giving to the church. In fact, our money is only one thing that we get to be generous with. God calls us to a life of generosity, and giving to Pond Hill is not going to fully complete your cycle of generosity because there's a lot of people that you touch that Pond Hill does not touch. The homeless people that I give like a granola bar to they may never walk through the doors of this church. They may never call this church to get a food card or, or we, you know, we give those things out, but there are people that I see as Michael Sean that I have the opportunity to be generous with that Pond Hill Baptist Church will never have the opportunity to be generous with. So it's important that it's not relegated to just a 10% tithe, you're good. It's like you need to be generous with your whole life and find ways to do that and your generosity towards Pond Hill Baptist Church is a very small two paragraph compared to 11 pages of generosity amount of your generosity. Okay? We on the same page there? Yep. Cool. Let's wrap this thing up. Number five, it says this, generosity reminds us that we are not in control. Generosity reminds us that we are not in control. One more thing here. This is concerned about not just what you do with your money or what you do with your wealth or how you're generous. This is concerned with your mindset about generosity. Uh, and so I mentioned before that there were some people that were rich that had taken these Jewish uh, refugees and made them indentured servants, and then on top of that, mistreated them as indentured servants, okay? So in James chapter 5, I'm actually not going to read it because I'm running out of time. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, James spends some time like really condemning them, saying, these people are not good. They're going to, you know, they're going to get it in the long run. Like they, they might look like they're rich now, but it's not going to end well for them because they're evil and they're oppressing you and all this stuff, right? Well, he starts that and in 5.1. He says, go to now, you rich men, okay? He starts it there. Keep that in mind. Now go back to 4.13. Here's what 4.13, he says, go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city. So what I want to point out there. James is making a comparison between Christian Jews who are reading this letter 
and non-Christian rich oppressors, but he's comparing the two of them by starting his phrases with the same beginning, okay? That's the important thing that I want you guys to get. So he's saying, don't be like them. Here's my advice on how to not be like them. 4.13, go to now. Ye that say, today or tomorrow will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what's your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boasting, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him is sin. Like I said, this is contrasted with the next portion of scripture that's all condemnation. It's all negative. Those people are not going to be good. So the idea is that, right, you should say, if the Lord wills, you should recognize that the Lord is in control. Because when you don't and you fully rely on yourself, you become just like the people that are oppressing you. That is the idea that James is talking about. Now, wealth cannot bring control because wealth is temporary, right? Wealth cannot bring control because wealth is temporary. Ultimately, that's the principle for us to be generous, that we believe that there is something higher than just the stuff we have in our bank account or the things we have on our shelf or the stuff in our apartments or whatever. There's something higher than all of that. There is an eternal God and an eternal life that we're supposed to live in perspective of, right? So we can't be those people that say, man, I am in control. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Planning is great. There's nothing, that's not what the scripture is about. What the scripture is about is saying you are not in control of your life, and therefore you are not in control of your finances, right? God is. Ultimately, yes, he's given you choice. Yes, he's given you blessings. Ultimately, though, it belongs to him. And so we really cannot walk through life with this idea that everything's about us and we can make our decisions and we can spend our money how we want to and nobody should be telling us how to spend our money and all that stuff. No, God owns your money. God owns your time. God owns you, whether you think it or not. You belong to the Lord and so he has a say in what you do and what you don't do. And more importantly, he's the one in control. So take your eyes off of yourself and look around at the things that he cares about. James 1, 9 through 10, I just want to read this to close. It says this, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but, let, but the rich in that he's made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. Let's pray. God, you are so, so good. You are a generous God. And we, I want to say thank you for the gifts, the blessings that you've given to us, not the least of which is your son, Jesus, who came with the intention to die a terrible death and be punished for our sins so that we could have a new birth. We could have eternal life through you. Thank you so much for what you did on the cross. Thank you for being generous. We did not deserve it, but you gave it anyway because you are the father of lights that gives good gifts at all times. I pray that in view of that, in view of your generosity, we would also be generous because we, as Christians, want to reflect your character. I think that that is something that I can say unilaterally, that we want to be like you. We want to show the world how good you are. And so I pray that we would be generous, that you would convict us in areas that we're not generous and that you would bring wisdom in areas where we're trying to be generous. Help us not to be stagnant, not to just write a check and forget about it, but help us to constantly be thinking about generosity, be thinking about looking for the less equitable than we, than, than we are, than, and help us to uh, reach out to them in special ways, to pay special attention to them, because we know that you are paying special attention to them as well. Here do I pray. Amen. Amen. I think it would be an awesome idea for you guys to read through James. We read a lot of it today, honestly. We, we read something from every chapter except for chapter 3, I believe. But um, in chapter five, uh, but I would I think it'd be a great idea for you guys to go back and read that. If you want something to memorize this week, James one nine through ten, which we just read, I think is a great great thing to memorize. James one nine through ten. If you've not received the gift of Christ yet, if you've not trusted in Jesus for salvation, if you don't know what that means, if uh, I was saying some things that you were having some questions about, we would love to help you with that. We believe that the greatest gift ever given is God's son that leads to eternal life. And we would love to talk to you about that. So come grab uh, me, come grab somebody else. Many of us would be
thrilled to talk to you more about Jesus, and uh, we would love for you to trust him today. For those of you that already trust Jesus and want to follow in what the scripture has commanded here, um, find ways to be generous with, to someone with less social equity than you this week. So that's going to first require us to be looking for those people, and second, require us to do something, to be a doer of the word and do something about that situation. It could be as simple as giving somebody that's homeless food. It could be as simple as maybe giving for the first time to the church. It could be as simple as going and writing a line item in your budget for some of this stuff. Um, whatever it is for you, like I said, I'm not going to tell you how to spend your money, um, but God might. So pray and listen to him and ask him for wisdom in this matter.